Manhattan, the Bronx and Staten Island too. But I shall never forget one that on Howard Duff show on Sam Spade that Elliot It's Lewis made, and Elliot was totally unaware of it, and Lorene Tuttle was totally unaware. Was which was. I'll be up to see you in the morning, and he said, "I'll be up you in the morning." And of course, the whole audience fell apart. <laughs> and there, Elliot and Lorene were absolutely serene, didn't know what everybody was falling apart about. And Bill Spear was on the floor in the control room. <laughs> That's one I remember very definitely. <laughs> The subway charms us so. Broadway is my beat. First took to the air from New York on February 27, 1949, starring Anthony Ross and directed by John Dietz. After 15 weeks, with Dragnet breaking new police procedural ground on NBC, CBS moved the show's production to Hollywood. Elliot Lewis was by then helping to edit scripts for Bill Spear on Suspense. With the urging of men like Spear and Bill Robeson, Lewis was given the chance to direct the newly migrated series. He was born in Manhattan on November 28, 1917, and knew the city well. He told Radio Life, "You should hear the city constantly. Even the people in New York are noisy." Three sound men were often needed to recreate that New York flavor. I always found acting boring because there's not enough to do. You do it and then you're finished. And now what are you going to do? You know. They would go back to the office to do rewrites and changes and all that kind of stuff. So I would go into the booth and listen when I wasn't on in the scene, and then I'd go back to the office and they'd let me sit there with them when they were doing rewrites and cuts. So I got interested in all of it. And when I started working on suspense, Spear asked me because I was writing suspense in addition to acting on it. I wrote some of them and I edited a great many of them. And Spear had to go away, and he asked me if I wanted to direct it, and I said, "Yeah, sure." So I directed one, and then the CBS people wanted to do Broadway's My Beat, which had been on in the East. They wanted to move it out here, and they needed a producer director. More fine, David Friedkin was going to write it, and we cooked up the idea of scoring it with a jazz orchestra, and got Sandy Courage for that. I all of a sudden was directing a show every week. Lewis's first regular turn as a director came on July 7th, 1949, when the repackaged Broadway Is My Beat debuted as a summer replacement for the FBI in Peace and War. Along with David Freakin, Morton Fine would become one of Lewis's chief go-to writers. Broadway Is My Beat is the first series you wrote regularly. Was it your idea or your and David's no, idea? No, as a matter of fact, it had been done before David and I got hold of it. It was done out in New York. And the Mavens in New York felt that whoever was writing it in New York was not capturing the flavor of New York, so they brought it to Hollywood, <laughs> where two other writers caught the flavor allegedly of New York by so, sitting down in Hollywood and writing. I'll take Manhattan. Larry Thor would star as Danny Clover. Larry Thor, marvelous man. We were good buddies. An amusing anecdote about Larry, which is revealing us to the kind of pixie character he was in real life. He wanted to know what time it was, so he called the operator and asked her what time it was, and she wouldn't tell him. <laughs> he got back on the phone, asked for long distance. He went to talk person to person with his brother Magnus Thor in Reykjavik, Iceland, and he asked her what time it was there. He wanted to know whether he was calling at a proper hour. She told him. He then subtracted nine hours from that and found out what time it was in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> Rounding out the regular cast was Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian, doubling as both Sergeant Mugovan 
and Dr. Sinsky. My start was at CBS Radio here in Hollywood, doing a sustaining show, we used to call those. It meant you didn't get paid. That's right. right? right. sponsored yeah. It also meant you didn't get paid in those days. Oh, really? $3? No. 1938? Okay. I got gore. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was 13 weeks. A wonderful experience because I got to play a different foreign character every week. And at the age of 16, that was pretty exciting. How about me. that? That's pretty, this kid here, are you kidding? She was a baby. Yeah. I was at least, I was a graduate of high school. What can I say about Jack? He always played two parts on Broadway's My Beat. One of Dr. Sinsky, a character who was the medical doctor for the police department. And whoever else was needed as a character within the play. But he always doubled. Broadway's My Beat featured some of the best Hollywood radio talent, like Barney Phillips, Virginia Gregg, Tony Barrett, Herb Butterfield, Betty Lou Gerson, Hi Averback, Kathy Lewis, Harry Bartell, Lawrence Dobkin, Mary Jane Croft, and Herb Vigrant. Although no sponsorship was forthcoming, CBS Brass was impressed with Elliot Lewis's capabilities. By September of 1953, Broadway Is My Beat was airing on Saturday evenings at 8 p.m. Broadway's My Beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When it's September and the summer sighs away, Broadway is festooned with the colors of fall. The pastels of the cotton dresses mix sadly with the brown and gray of the flannel. And here and there, Broadway's shapely foliage turns to plaid. It's the time of the quickened step and the crumpled travel folder and Coney dyed beaver. And the September song is a deep-throated sound, the mob voice, the hay fever, and the oysters being torn from the half shell. Another season, kid. One more three months band to get where you're going. And the autumn days have their six o'clock in the morning time, the just beginning another day time. It was a street where Broadway turns a corner into the 40s, where I was, and Detective Mugovan, and a woman. She's in here, Danny, in this car. Right there on the floor in front. Who is she? Well, I don't know. No identification, no handbag. Just this. Hmm? Car registered to Edward Bishop, 1110 160th. Uh-huh. Slippers in the glove compartment. Who found her? Officer Kaplan. Tagged it late last night for traffic violation parking. Five o'clock when he was going off duty, he noticed the car still wasn't moved. Opened it, looked. Found her under that blanket. I'd say she was about 27, huh? Shot once in the back. From up close. Yeah. Death probably instantaneous. Um, here they are, Danny. In the front of the car, Doc. Hey, you're a new Doc, aren't you? Uh, don't move her, Doctor. Wait for the photographers. But don't just stand there, Doc. You gotta... <laughs> you get used to it, kid. This kind of thing happens a lot. <laughs> And the cluster of the walkers to work, the people of the subway, glad for the delay of the dead woman, the dead woman who lies at the beginning of another day, stops it for a time, holds it, the desolate pause, the time for turning back. But the hungry day will not wait. The subways are empty and must be filled. The clever machines in the offices long for the fluttering caress of quick fingers. Can't stop for the dead kid, a buck has to be made. Give someone else your place in line. And in the corridor of the address on the registration slip, a woman in a raveled coat sweater sweeps away the night litter and autumn mists, gathers them on a dustpan, throws them into the street. You ask for Edward Bishop, and she shrugs you to a scarred door at the end of the hall, watches you as you knock, waits with you for the door to open. 
You're an early bird, mister. Police. Huh? Oh, my. The woman drops her broom, scurries away to tell her friends and neighbors. Early bird out to catch a worm, huh, mister? Not me, not for something I've done. I never do anything bad. You, Edward Bishop? Oh, not me. Mr. Bishop's my roomie. Uh, he gone and done something naughty? Come in, mister, and tell me all about it. Where is he? Oh, out frying his nightly kettle of fish, I presume. His bed ain't been slept in. No? Huh? Oh, oh my, that, that hollow you see in the bedclothes is where I tried it. Uh, I'm an experimenter. Long as he wasn't in it, I thought my roomie's bed might be better than my own. It wasn't. Mr. Bishop's gone and done something naughty, huh? Do you know where he is? I want to tell you something about Mr. Bishop, my roomie. He's a tight-lipped man. Rock face, I call him, when he ain't looking. That's because he never whispers a secret to me or shares a coke when I offer him part of mine. He just lets me dab his hanky with cologne sometimes when he's going out for a heavy evening. He had a lot of them, evenings like that? Well, for a man who has to shave twice a day, he has more than his share. You wouldn't know with whom? Oh, I might. But first you tell me what my roomie did to you. Maybe you'd find it cozier down at headquarters. Maybe that Japanese kimono you wear makes it... You're getting rough. Hello there, mister. I'll tell you what I know, then you tell me what you know, huh? My roomie's been squiring a lady by the name of Anna Compton. You know her? Oh, just to talk to on the phone. A lovely voice. Haunts you. When did you talk to her last? Oh, two or three days ago. I'll tell you just how it was. She kept calling here evenings, asking my roomie to call her back. Uh, just leave her name, Anna Compton. <laughs> my roomie, squiring a married lady. Bishop never shared anything with you, and still I'll you... tell you about that, too. Her, her haunting voice made me nervous. I told you I'm an experimenter. So one day I sat down with the phone book and called every Compton there is. Then a man answered and said his wife Anna wasn't home. Who was calling? <laughs> of course I hung up. Then you know her address. In the New Rochelle phone book for everyone's eyes to see. Now it's your turn. What did Mr. Bishop do? A woman was found murdered in his car. Oh my, oh, my. That's as naughty as you can get, ain't it? Mr. Blackburn said that. Then Mr. Blackburn reached over to my lapel, pinched off a piece hanging from the buttonhole, and dangled it accusingly under my nose. This is the way I left Mr. Blackburn. Then back to headquarters, issue an all-points bulletin for Edward Bishop. Then down one flight to the photo lab, be handed a picture. Tuck it in the black notebook where you've jotted the name of Leo Compton and his address in New Rochelle. Then the ride there to the community where the houses have the built-in attitude that violent death never visits here. In the next street maybe it happens, or to a friend of a friend, but it never happens here. Anna? Anna, is that you? Lost your key? Anna, where have you been? Oh. Is your name Compton? Leo Compton, that's right. I'm from the police. My name is Danny Clover. Oh, yeah? Uh, mind if I come in? Well, I guess so. All right. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute there. Yeah? Police! Mr. Compton... It's about Anna. It's about Anna, isn't it? What's happened to her? Listen to me, Mr. Compton. All right, all right, I'm listening. I... Is Anna your wife? Yes, yes, yes. This... Uh... This woman, this picture I have here. Yes, that's Anna. Yeah. How did you get that? How'd you get Anna's picture? I wish I knew some way to say this. Anna's dead. We found her this morning. She'd been shot. Oh. She. Her body's at the morgue. Anna. I've got to ask you. I know, I know. She didn't come home last night, Mr. Compton. No, no, you're wrong. She came home. Anna came home to me. At... It was my fault, really. I sent her away. I told her I didn't care. And the things I said to her, the names. Suppose the last words you ever said to your wife were names like that. What happened last night, Mr. Compton? Well, she came home. It was about seven yesterday evening. And she had the bracelet on. She was wearing a bracelet when we found her. She had the bracelet on. And I asked her where she got such an expensive bracelet to wear. And she said she got a bargain. A bargain. What do you mean? From her boyfriend. Oh, she told me. Anna told me all right. And listen. Listen, you know what I did? I called him up. I'm not narrow-minded. Things can happen just because it's your wife. It doesn't mean it can't happen. I called her boyfriend up. And I told him to come over. I'd pay him for the bracelet. Did he come over? Oh, he came over. 
And it was stunned all right. And I wrote a check for the bracelet, $200. Don't you think Anna wasn't stunned? Mr. Compton. Don't you know what she did? She left with him anyhow. Bracelet, check, she, and him. And that's when I said What was the man's up. name? Bishop, Edward Bishop. He's an auctioneer for the Hunter Galleries. Oh, there's something else. Yes? I'll call for Anna. I'll take her out of that place where she is. Come in off the Avenue of the Americas, mister. Behind these dirty shop windows, there are bargains. Edward Bishop work here? He did, till he killed himself a woman, ran up a parking ticket. You know all that for sure. I know Eddie, he works for me. The pitchman to end all pitchmen. The spiel that kills, that's uh, Eddie Bishop. He talk you into buying something you don't like, mister? You said he killed her. Why? You're a cop, aren't you? Come inside, I'll brew you something warm. It gets cold for everybody on the avenue. No, uh, leave the door open. A looker might want to come in to browse. That's how it is in the world. Lookers, browsers, handlers. Then walk out. Just like my Eddie. You want a sip of the warm brew? Why did you say he killed her? (sighs) It's in Eddie to do a thing like that. It's what's about him that fascinates a girl. That and the clever way he handles an auctioneer's hammer. I could show you a three-time bruise. Three times in your soul on a man like Eddie. You read in the papers a woman is found dead in Bishop's car, and that makes you know he's a murderer. That and the way he spoke my name sometimes after we closed up the shop. Zoe, he'd say to me. Zoe killed a long day for me. You don't argue with a man like Eddie when he talks like that. You knew Mrs. Compton? When the summer began to fade, Eddie started talking to me about her. How she looked when she walked in one day to bid on an object of art. Then how she looked over a cocktail at a corner bar. And then how it was with the lights of Coney on her face and in Eddie's car on the long way to New Rochelle. All this my auctioneer told me. That's how I know the dead Mrs. Compton. I'm glad for her. You never saw her with him? It was last night. I watched from behind the counter. I saw her shove her wrist at Eddie. Eddie put a bracelet on it, one he'd bought from stock. I thought it was for me. Right in front of me, he did it. If it was like that for them, why would he kill her? Who knows? Maybe she rubbed him the wrong way. Maybe she asked him for it. Eddie was a man to oblige a lady. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, do something for me, mister. What? You find Eddie Bishop, give him my message. Tell him I want an invite to his execution. It's been a dull season. Danny? Over here in the squad car. Well, you got something, Mugovan? Well, maybe, maybe not. Guy was found dead in the building excavation over on 3rd. Nobody wants to touch him. Yeah, let's go. Drive down the ramp, Mugovan. Yeah. Well, this sidewalk superintendent's really got something to stare at now. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, what happened, mister? Him. Him and a scoop happened. Half hour ago, I decided to scratch this ground. First scoop full of shovel come up with was him. Hey, let's get it down, huh? Sure. Okay. Yeah, real good. I'll take a look, huh? Shot, Danny. Now, here's a wallet. Hey, look at this. Check for $200 signed by Leo Compton. Uh-huh. Pay to the order of Edward Bishop. 
Edward Bishop. He's the man we figured murdered Anna Compton. Yeah, the man we figured murdered Anna Compton. What? Well, what'd you say, Danny? Nothing. I didn't say anything at all. This episode featured Howard McNear, Forrest Lewis, and Lou Krugman. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The training area in in those days of radio, because you had the opportunity of doing as many shows as we did, that itself was a training, and that goes back when you'd start doing 40, 45 shows a week. And actually, I remember one show called 7 O'Clock Final, and they would be writing the show while you were on the air. And the scripts would be coming in page by page. You play this, you play this German character, uh, Spanish, French. September morn dips a dainty toe into a Broadway billboard and unshivering gazes down upon a street that only yesterday was choked with summer. But the refuse is there, where summer has passed and left pieces of itself. In the scratch and warp of summertime blues still screeching out of the loudspeakers. The sunny mannequins, wax slightly melted, waiting in shop windows to be replaced by the fall and winter models. The faint odors of the sun-warmed perfume, the souvenir of the golden girl who walked right past you, turned a corner, vanished into a place where summer never dies. A place not open to you, kid. Only autumn's ahead of you, kid. Start using it. It's already given you two murders. A woman in the front seat of a car, a man scooped out of the earth on the teeth of a steam shovel. What more can you ask? September's showering her gifts on you, kid. Take them. They're all yours. And at headquarters, Sergeant Tataglia brings you your share of them. Holds them from you with a smile that shows he slept well last night. The accumulated bottoms on the murders, Danny. In these papers, I tease before you. Uh, have a good night, Gino. No complaints come to mind, Danny. The evening was a fulsome one. Father McCleary came to call. A pleasant time was had by all, as is our usual procedure. Yeah, Father McCleary is a fine man. Salt of the earth. I asked Mrs. T to break open a bottle of Morgan Dovered wine. He don't even blink an eye. Sips with you, talks with you, brings presents for the Tartaglia brood. This is a man who also brings you the gift of restful sleep. Remember me to him, Gino. Roger, we'll go. Now, to the papers I am about to bestow upon you. In them, you will find a report from Technical, to wit. The bullets that killed Mrs. Compton and Mr. Bishop, Technical States, came from the same gun. Mm-hmm. Markings are identical. The rundown on the past histories of Mrs. Compton and Mr. Bishop is contained in reports from interested neighbors and relatives gathered hey, by... Uh... You'll spare me a moment, Mr. Clerk. Look, you. Standard operating procedure is to knock when one desires a moment of Danny Come in, Mr. Compton. I've come to demand something, Mr. Clover. And I intend to. Not leaving here until you give it to me. What would that be? Anna's bracelet. The one that... Well, everyone's dead. It belongs to me. Because you gave Bishop a $200 check for it? I stopped payment on my check. After all that, that Mr. Bishop did give it to Anna... I needn't have made that stupid gesture. And now she's dead. And he's dead. Yes, your wife is dead. You loved her, you told me. The bracelet's mine. You want to quibble about it? Have me spend money on lawyers? You're right, Mr. Compton. It's yours. Take it. We've no more use for it. We have photographs. You understand. It's not the money. It's only that if it once belonged to her, it now belongs to me. It's a kind of... Remembrance uh, of the dead? Well, I'm not going to think about it. I have enough trouble living in an empty house with no one to scrimp and save all my life, share it with Mrs. Compton. And the cost of things, Mr. Clover, it's outrageous food, furniture, clothes, and transportation. You know what cab fare cost me from New Rochelle? Five sixty. It's outrageous. You could have come in another way. Oh, yes, and be mocked at, pointed to, as the husband of a murdered woman... They put my picture in the paper, you know, and that makes me a curiosity, a freak. You didn't tell me when I last saw you, Mr. Compton. What did you do after your wife left you with Bishop? What's that? I said, what did you do? Go anywhere, talk to anyone? Well, of course I talked to someone. A man's wife walks out on him when he's given her all this. Who? Mervyn Mago. He's an old friend from boyhood. I go to him whenever I'm in trouble. He's a professional helper. He's in that business. He makes money by helping people? He runs a mission on East 40th. You'll like him, I think. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Clover. You were easier to deal with than I thought. Danny, a man's wife is murdered and he comes back for... Danny, you think... It's something to think about, huh, Jim? It was something to think about. Consider a man whose wife had been murdered. Consider, in space of 24 hours, his tears had dried, the shock of death had dwindled into something much more negotiable. A $200 bracelet, for example. The grief tempered by the high cost of taxi cab fares. Leo Compton had motive enough to commit two murders. His wife because she had run out on him, Edward Bishop because he had run with her. Motive, certainly. So check on his story. Item. He was a man who needed companionship at the time of stress. Specifically, he liked to talk to a man who ran a mission. Go to the man who ran a mission and ask questions. Glad you came to see me, Mr. Clover. I really am. So am I, Mr. Mago. A dozen checkerboards and a few back-issue magazines. You'll admit that I do the best I can. Then there's always the coffee and donuts. The boys expect them. Standard fare for places like this. Sure. Now... Uh... Once I got a bright idea. Put in a ping-pong table. Build it myself. You know, ping-pong for the boys. A little physical exercise. What happened? The boys didn't understand about ping-pong. Took down the net. Made a backstop out of the old magazines. Well, I confiscated the dice. <laughs> Loaded. How often does Leo Compton come down here? Sometimes often. Sometimes not for months at a time. Whenever Leo feels the need. Need of what? Someone to talk to. But why do you? Because he doesn't have to explain himself to me. The embarrassment of bearing himself to someone doesn't have to be done. I know him, Mr. Clover. I know him well. That's what I want you to tell me about, Mr. Mago. I guess it was 20 years ago I met Leo... We went to the same summer camp in the Catskills, a charity camp. I was his big brother assigned with a counselor. You know, the older camper. I showed him how to put a French tuck in a bed, his swimming buddy. You know? Uh-huh. And since then, when, whenever he got into with trouble... With himself or with the world, he came to me. I like to think I'm necessary to Leo. I can understand. Leo is a product, Mr. Clover. The making of a living, the background of poverty... Even now, now that he's fairly well-to-do, it still eats him. What does? Even at camp, the pattern was there. He would organize little card games after lights out, wouldn't play himself, but took a cut from every pot. That sort of thing all his life. I see. Tell me something else. When his wife ran out on him, he came down here to talk to you. What did he say? Not a whole lot. He told me the story. I listened. That's just about all he wanted down here. He told you and then he went home, is that it? Not right away. He told me, and then the boys started to straggle in for their coffee and donuts. He joined them. He always does. He ate four of those donuts, Mr. Clover. I have always felt that everybody in the entertainment business should know enough about every part of the entertainment business so that they respect what the other people are doing. Any actor who comes in and mutters about a script should be sat in front of a typewriter and put a piece of yellow paper in the typewriter and say, fade in, interior Lucy's living room day. She comes down the stairs, her hair and curls. Go. Give me the other 32 pages, you know, and then argue about is this a good script or a bad script. And conversely, the writer who is, oh, these lines are so precious, should be made to stand in front of an audience and read aloud a bad joke and look like a fool. As the actor does while the guy, you look into the wings and the writer just went, oh, well. they go, right on, baby. You're standing there with mud on your face. You know, you just made one of those big things and nothing happened. And the writer's going, oh. Oh, sure, Mugovan. What is it? I want you to talk to a man. Yeah, come on in, Mr. Scott. Uh, this is Mr. Scott, Danny. Mr. Scott, Lieutenant Clover. I do. Uh, oh, sit down, Mr. Scott. Sure, right there. It'll be fine. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Scott. Give the lieutenant the bracelet. Oh, thank you. I uh, thought it was the right thing to do, Lieutenant Clover. I saw the man's picture in the paper mixed up in a murder and... Then that he should all of a sudden the come, to me, Mrs. come up was to me wearing. of all yeah, people and out of the side of his mouth off of the Where did you get this bracelet, Mr. Scott? 
I told you, didn't I? Oh, I'm sorry. Would you mind telling me again? Mm. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Scott. Please do. Well, here I was walking toward the subway entrance on 59th Street, and he come up to me. Who did? The man whose picture was in the paper about his wife's being slain, that's who. He means Leo Compton. I mean Leo Compton. He plucked my sleeve. He offered to sell me this bracelet. He said he was making deliveries for a jewelry concern, and the bracelet was left over, and nobody seemed to know where it come from. Uh-huh. Uh, how much did you pay for it, Mr. Scott? Ridiculous price. He asked $5.60 for it, and that's what I give him. You, you might as well know, too, that he kept turning his face for me, but I certainly recognized him. That's why I've come here. Uh, Muggerman, write Mr. Scott a voucher for five sixty, dollars and uh, thank you very much, Mr. Scott. <laughs> You call me in, Danny, and you ask me to step over into a department that's not strictly mine. And uh, why don't you wait for the reports from technical? Huh? All I want is an opinion, Dr. Sinsky. Whose toes would you step on if you give me that? Gordon of technical. <laughs> All right, so he deserves a toe smashy once in a while. What do you want of me, Danny? You examined Mrs. Compton. The bullet wound, yeah. the, the type of wound where it was in her back, is it one that would bleed freely? Oh, yes, Danny, but... You know these things as well as I. Why do I just you got ask? these photographs. Uh, hey, look at them. The inside of the car where Mrs. Compton was found. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Sinsky? <laughs> you know as well as I Tell me Danny. anyway. I, I want to be sure. It is obvious that the loss of blood in the car was slight, which makes it to me apparent that the woman was not shot in the car but somewhere else and then put into the car and... Uh, I'm a doctor, Danny, not a... A detective? I didn't mean it to sound like that. Yeah, not... yeah, I know. Thanks for the opinion, Dr. Sinsky. It's all around in the backyard. Go through the gate. Well, I hope you appreciate me creating all this stuff for you. Why, it's you, Mr. Clover. Moving day, Mr. Compton? Huh? Oh, no, no, no. My wife's things. It's hard to live with. I see. Giving them away, huh? Well, not exactly. Selling them? I saw an ad in the paper where they buy merchandise. Like... Well, yes, yes, I'm selling Anna's clothes. Why? How much are you getting for them? Why? I'm curious. Why? Five sixty for a bracelet worth two hundred. A man like you to do that strange. How do you know about the bracelet? The man you sold it to got scared. The bracelet was mine to sell. Why should he get scared? That's not the point, Mr. Compton. The point is why you should sell such a valuable bracelet for so little. You could have gotten more. I got what I wanted. Yeah, I guess you did. You broke even. Bishop gave your wife the bracelet, so legally it's yours. But you'd paid him for I it. I told you that. You gave him the check so we'd find it on him. So your story of what happened the night of your wife's death would hold up. What's that? But with Bishop dead... The bracelet legally yours anyhow. Why should you be liable for the check? His estate would have the check cashed. Well, that's right, I did. I, I gave him a check for Stop it. Stop payment on it, too. That's right. Why should I spend money I don't have to? Sure. You see what I mean, don't you? Sure. You know, you're a funny man, Mr. Compton. Well, I guess people say that about me. I don't care. You're so careful with money, and you're an honest man. But you couldn't stand having that bracelet around. It was a symbol of what your wife did to you. So you sold it for the cost of your cab fare, even all round. <laughs> That's how much you know. I lost plenty. I lost my wife. You're a funny man. I told you my wife had a boyfriend, and I was ready to forgive her. She walked out on me anyhow. Oh, she would have come back, don't you worry You'd about already that. killed her when you called Bishop. Look, I ki I told yeah, you that... Yeah, I know. I told you how it was. I said then that... Then when Bishop arrived, you killed him, too. Wrote out a check and stuck it in his pocket. Put your wife and Bishop in Bishop's car as if she'd left with him. She did, I told... Oh, you didn't listen at all. I could call technical. They'd find blood in your house, no matter how hard you scrubbed. You don't understand anything. I worked hard all my life. I put my own price on things. My wife belonged to me. She was mine. And nobody gets it. Not for a $200 bracelet, they don't. What do you think I am, anyhow? Let's go, For Mr. a bracelet? Compton. What good is that? What did she need that for? As if it were something. I'm a hard worker. 
Things I own didn't come easy. What's going to happen to them now? Mr. Clover, you better get in touch with Mr. Mago. He'll know how to advise me. Well, he's just like a big brother to me. It's the journey to the end of all the other streets in the world, this Broadway. You turn a corner and you're there. Walk it slowly. Lean your heart against it. Shop for the kicks, the bargains, the heartbreak. Until it all explodes in your face. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. I was challenged once by Bill Robeson, who is, you know, one of our finest radio directors ever, a producer, director, and a fine writer as well. But he had interviewed me and said, what is this now that you double? And I said, oh, yeah, I can do, you know, a couple of voices. He says, can you talk to yourself? And I said, well, I guess, why not? Well, he brought me on a show with Elliot Lewis and had me play five parts. And he kept waiting for me to complain, and I never said a word. I just marked all the parts. And a couple of them were just one-liners. But still, one time I had three characters on the same page all talking to themselves, me. <laughs> that's we got not easy. I no, bet that's We got off the air, and he said... I guess you can double. <laughs> Just like that. It was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. And then during the actual broadcast, you're there. Right. As a rule. Just, you know, the word fell. Fell means uh, you get a marvelous bourbon feeling in your gut, and there are your words going over the air, coast to coast. And it was a marvelous feeling. You sat down Monday and wrote the words, and Saturday, you're the word, coast to coast. Is there a similar feeling for uh, television work? Yeah, but television was always pressure. And it wasn't nearly as much fun. Mm. 